So remember, too, also to uh, continue to pray for Joy, Joy's healing, please. Yes, uh, Uh, here's just a couple thoughts to begin, get your mind working. You know when you're in trouble? You know you're in trouble. When your wife phones and says you're eating out, and when you get home, you find a sandwich, sandwich on the front lawn, you know you're in trouble. There was a little girl named Mary who was visiting her grandparents' farm. She was investigating the chicken lot when she came upon a peacock. She quickly ran into the farmhouse and said, Granny, Granny, come quickly. One of your chickens is in bloom. <laughs> Juanito's laughing. All right, last lesson for experiencing God. And uh, so uh, and we're, we're, we're going to take a spiritual inventory tonight. Prior to worship, how much time do you normally spend preparing your heart? Do you prepare yourself spiritually when you get ready to come to God's house to worship? Or do you expect God to prepare you to worship Him? I think uh, I think sometimes we kind of we may we may we, we may forget that uh, there's probably an obligation on our part to prepare our hearts, our minds, our spirit if we if we want to worship, you know, uh, we have an obligation I think to do some of that preparation prior to prior to meeting with God, and that's what. That's what worship should be like. It should be meeting with God. So, if you're not experiencing the kind of worship that you might want to be experiencing, uh, maybe you should try to uh, pray about that. And then, uh, you know, how much good does it do to, to fight on the way to church with your spouse and then walk in the door and smile at everybody? You know, doesn't do, doesn't... <laughs> there you go. Drive separate cars, solve that problem. So it's important to uh, to try to uh, prepare yourself, and not not only uh, prepare yourself, but pray for the people that are pray for Gordy and the praise and worship team. Pray for me. Pray for every, pray for your Sunday school teachers as they prepare their lessons. Uh, so, just an idea of what. Uh, of what you may want to look at in regards to preparation for prayer. Uh, there's a story in the uh, Experiencing God instructor's manual about a little girl. She was three years old, and uh, when her parents or grandparents would tell her, uh, come here, she would run the opposite direction. And she thought it was cute. She would run away from them. Uh, and uh, not only did she say it, think it was cute, her parents and grandparents thought it was cute. So they actually reinforced her behavior. One day, when she was out playing in the front yard, the gate was open, and she ran out between two parked cars. The mother saw a car coming down the street and shouted to the little girl, come here. And uh, the little girl laughed and stepped out into the street in front of the oncoming car, and she was killed. Uh, the guy that wrote that in the book says that's the first funeral he ever had to conduct, was that little girl's funeral. Uh, now, if you see a child doing something wrong, do you, uh, do you ever correct them? Do you ever punish them for repeated disobedience? Yeah, you better. Uh, if you love them, 
Hebrews 12.6. If you love them, uh, Hebrews 12.6 says that the Lord does this to those that he loves. The Lord chastises, disciplines those he loves. And he, he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Have you ever thought about that? That last part of that verse? What does that last part of that verse tell you? Somebody share your thoughts with us? How does that, what does that say to you? Yeah, he's accurate in the, his interpretation of the Greek. Yeah, and the, uh, that word says punishes. The New King James says scourges. So, uh, if God loves you, he's going to discipline you. So, should we be, should we be discipliners? In our, in our interpersonal relations, uh, in, our, in our family relations? Not so much in our interpersonal relations. In our church relations, should we be discipliners? Or should we ignore the sin of our brothers and sisters when we become aware of it? See, the world's told us that when we discipline church members, that means we don't love them. But see, that's the world's definition of love. Christ says, God says, that God actually, uh, the inference is, is that it's God's responsibility to us to punish us when we have sin in our life. Why does he want to punish us? What's the, what's the rationale? To bring us back, exactly, to purify us. But, you know, the modern-day church has shied away from discipline in, in a lot of areas. And one reason, I think, is at one time it was used uh, out of vengeance. It was abused. But... It's gotten to the point where it's gone in the opposite direction. There's a question in your, uh, in your outline. It says, if you see a Christian brother or sister doing something that is going to hurt them, which of the flowering would be an expression of a God-like love? And it says you can check all that apply. So the first one we've already said is wrong. Second one, do you want to be open-minded? The world wants you to be open-minded. I can guarantee you that. The world wants you to be open-minded. I might, how about giving them a hint that you disapprove? That would be the second thing. What would be the first thing? Okay. I would go to them privately and share my concern. Okay. And then the last one, you would go, <laughs> go straight to the old elders and demand they be kicked out of church. Of course, that's not that's not the way it works. Uh, you know, when God disciplines His children, He demonstrates, according to Hebrews twelve six, He demonstrates His love for them. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves. Okay. And uh, if we love our brothers and sisters. Will God, might God use us as an instrument of that discipline? Yeah. He has to use somebody, unless he's going to do it divinely, all right? And the thing about church discipline is that it's designed to be a, a help, not a hindrance. But it has to be done always out of a spirit of love. And the Bible, you know, I've talked to you plenty of times about Matthew 18. Uh, and there's four stages to that discipline. The first stage is what? Matthew 18, you want to bring that up, uh, Deanna? You go to the person, and what do, you, uh, what do you do when you go to that person? You verbalize to them their fault. You tell them what you think they're doing 
you, you specifically tell them what you think. Uh, Matthew 18, uh, 15. Uh, you specifically tell them what you, what you see as the fault in their life, the sin in their life. Okay? So that's the first thing you do. What's the next thing you do? Yes, you can take one. Uh, and after that first one, it says, if he listens to you, what happens? You have won your brother over. You've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others, depending on the person. You don't want to intimidate them. Take one or two others so that every matter may be established by the testimony of the two or three witnesses. That's to make sure that there's no gray area about what's being talked about. Okay? Then what's the next step? If they refuse to listen, you tell the church. Now it's my experience that almost every time, because uh, I've been involved this in, in numerous places, almost every time, if the person has a heart for the Lord, you never go past the first step. A couple times, I've seen it go to the second step. But you know what happens after the second step if they won't listen? They leave the church. They leave the church. And part of the reason is because they know what's coming next. And if they leave the church, you're not to tell the church because there's no reason to tell the church if they leave the church. But it's very, very important to understand that these are the words of Jesus Christ. These aren't the words of Steve Medeiros. And then the last thing that it says to do, it says to, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, you're supposed to, this one says, treat him as you would a pagan, some versions will say Gentile or a tax collector. Now really what it says, there's really five steps. You go and show fault, and I say there's five steps. You, you take one or two with you. You tell the church. You treat them like a pagan or a tax collector. But the phrase that's, who has something besides treat him? in your Bibles. That's, those, that's a good translation. Let him be. You're done with him. Because those words, that when Jesus says to treat them like a, one says pagan, uh, New King James says uh, Gentile, I think, tax collector, how Jesus is saying, this is the, this is the, this is the way you should express yourself to these people. How would a Jew express themselves to a tax collector? They wouldn't speak to him. I'm sorry. They wouldn't speak to him. If they won't listen. And, pardon me? Go ahead. Yeah, the problem is is that a lot of churches don't want to pre treat Christians as if they're adults. And I'm, I'm diametrically opposed to not treating Christians like they're adults. They make their decisions. You need to treat them as if they're adults, not, not children. What you should be, uh, uh, because you end up investing a lot of time in those type of things, often to your own detriment, and what you should be is caring for each other. We should invest that time, like caring for David and Deanna and their kids. Uh, what's her name? Jennifer and her kids. Getting to know them, investing uh, uh, extra time and effort with that, those type of people that are uh, new to the body rather than uh, trying to uh, reconnect with people that decide as, as adults, 
that they, they've decided they need to leave the body. Okay? Now, that's, that's my opinion. Uh, but I, but I, think, I think people are responsible for their own decisions. And uh, it's been my experience that uh, people do exactly what they want to do except when they're being led by the Lord. The Lord. The Lord doesn't let you do what you want to do. But when you're being led by the Lord. So, th so think about that. And if you have any questions, let me know so we can talk about it. But it says to let them be. And it, it, it means, that's very emphatic in the Greek. It says to, to let them be. Leave them alone. And, you know, and I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about anybody that's left our church. Uh, you know, we've, we've tried to, uh, anybody that we've talked to has always left after step two, like I've said before. Uh, and then, uh, but and the, most of the people that have left our church aren't, weren't leaving because of sin in their life. They were leaving because they wanted to leave. And my position is if they want to leave, let them leave. That's my personal position. Because I believe I have a responsibility to treat all of you that are adults like adults. That's just my, that's just my thoughts. So let's go back to the very beginning. All right? Let's go. We started this study in October. So it's taken about nine months, I think, and uh, not too many times off in that time. And what we've done in this, uh, is the chart still on the computer, Mary? Can you sh show Deanna where it is, if it is? What we've done is we've, we've broken our experiencing God, uh, how, we're, how we want to look at experiencing God, into these seven steps, all right? And the first one uh, on your outline, it says, what do we know about the reality of God's work? What is God doing? His work. He is, look at first number one. He's always at work around us, okay? So, if you don't know what God's doing, whose fault is it? It's ours. Because God's at work around us, all right? Second thing, what about our love relationship with God? Who's pursuing who? He loved us before we knew him. Who's pursuing who? He's pursuing you. Okay? He's pursuing you. He loved you before you even knew who he was according to the scriptures. Okay? And he's pursuing you to have a important part of that phrase, a real and personal relationship. Not something based upon uh, your feelings beyond your feeling of love for Him. Not something if, well, this feels good to me or this doesn't feel good to me. I like that. I don't like that. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a real personal love relationship where we're obedient and we acknowledge God as our Master, our Savior, and our Lord, all right? Number three, God's, God invites what? He invites us to become involved with him in his work. If you don't, if God, if you don't have an invitation from God to be doing his work today, it's because you're not listening to his invitation. Uh, I can think of very, I can think of very few circumstances where you might not be invited to do something. What did Paul, Paul's the perfect example. He's in prison, and what's he doing? He's teaching and preaching the word of God, and he's, giving, he's realizing converts to the gospel of Christ. So, next one. But he's inviting you to work with him, okay? Next one, he speaks to you by how? What are they? Holy Spirit. What else? Bible. What else? Prayers. What else? Circumstances and, and his church. All of those things. That's how he reveals himself to you and shows you what his purpose is 
and how he does things, his ways. All right? Last, the next one is a crisis of belief. When God gives you an invitation to work with him, is he going to want you to come to him like you are? No. He wants to stretch you. He wants to mold you. He doesn't want you to be who you are today. He wants to make you more in the image of Christ tomorrow. And to do that, he has to confront you. He has to bring you to a place of a crisis of belief. Do you believe what God is telling you is true? Do you believe it? Okay? Do you believe it? Are you going to stand on his promises and his word? Or are you going to stand on your thoughts? What you think is correct. All right? But every time God wants you to do something for him, he's going to try to grow you a little bit more. All right? And that growth requires two verbs for you to accomplish. The first one is faith as a verb, as an action word, and action. It's going to require you to believe more and to do more. All right? And then the next one is, it talks about uh, um, something major. What, what does it say about? You have to make, because of the invitation, which creates in you in a crisis of belief, you have to make a major adjustment in your life to join what God is doing. Think about the people of the Bible. Did Moses have to adjust his life? Yes. Did Joseph have to adjust his life? Yes. Did Abraham have to adjust his life? Yes. Did Paul, etc., etc., etc. They all had to make major adjustments in their life in, in those adjustments, then, they, they are able to join in God in what God is doing. And it's not that God's not going to do it, right? If you don't do it, if you don't adjust what? He's going to find somebody else to adjust. He'll find somebody else. God's will is not going to be thwarted, okay? And then, uh, see, I firmly believe that if I hadn't come and started a, a work for the Lord, somebody else would have there'd be some other church meeting in here today. I firmly believe that. You know, Dan Bailey, a good Christian man who used to be at Pomeroy, uh, him and I had a discussion how he always thought this would be the perfect place for a church in this Mormon community. And uh, so I, 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 firmly, I firmly believe if I hadn't come to do what the Lord wanted me to do, somebody else would have. So the Lord will take care of how how uh, he will take care of his ways uh, by his ways. And then the last one is you come to know God by experience, okay? You come to your knowledge of God. A lot of people get stagnated in their, in their God knowledge because they don't, they don't keep opening themselves to new venues, to new things to do for the Lord. A lot of people get a, in a comfort area, and then they won't do anything else. They won't, they, won't, they won't step out of that comfort area. You know, that was what was good to see about Gordy this year, how he stepped out to do something different. He's not, I'm not sure where he's at. He's not here. But, uh, and it's a good, you know, it's good to see, you know, Anita and Roger step up to try to do Awanas and things like that. Because all of those things are investments where God wants you to be utilized by him so that he can grow you to understand who he is better. And he does that by allowing you, allowing you to accomplish his work. He allows you to do that. All right? So I ask you the question in the outline, which of those realities is most meaningful to you? Oh. Hmm. Yeah. 
because uh, yeah, God's going to, God wants to stretch us. Yeah. And that's what I say. People get comfort. They get comfortable doing certain things. Uh, and sometimes they're not even things that they're necessarily good at. But if they're comfortable at doing them for some reason, they'll get, find themselves and they'll just stay there and stay there and stay there for years. And God wants, God wants, you know, nobody begins, there's nothing in the word that indicates you get saved and you're done. That you're, you're, you're as sanctified as you're ever going to be. Everything in the word indicates that you get saved and that's the first step. Then you've got a whole bunch of more steps to go in the process of sanctification and growing into the image of Christ. And then the next question is, have you experienced God in any special way during the study? That would be something that you would have to answer for yourself. But I, I, I ask you the, in the, uh, the next thing here is, uh, I, I ask you about the, which one of these conditions best describes how you feel about your love relationship with God today. And I ask you to check that all, all that apply. Is your love relationship growing sweeter every day? Or is it a roller coaster ride? Is it sweeter sometimes and tougher other times? Is your relationship with God today, your love relationship today, as solid as a rock? Is it as solid as a rock? Or is it cold? Is your relationship with the Lord today, is it a lukewarm relationship? Or is it a relationship that is uh, like a tree that is planted by the water? What happens to the trees that are down by the river? You know, this old tree out here, I guess there used to... Well, there's a lot of water that runs right by there when, uh, when it rains. That old tree, that old tree keeps growing, keeps going. Does your love relationship with the Lord today, do you need a tune-up? Or is your relationship with the Lord today bubbling over with joy? That reminds me of Rano. Bubbling over with joy. Wasn't she? And she was always so supportive. Such a sweet lady. Such a sweet lady. Is your love relationship with the Lord today deep and wide? Or is it shallow and narrow would be the other side of that. So, And then there's a blank even there. You can fill in uh, some other way to describe your relationship. And then, uh, and then I ask you another question. Which of the following best describes how you feel about your relationship with your church, the body of Christ? And if you're in the church, you know that you should be ready for a marathon. Churches, churches are a long haul. You should be ready for... <laughs> you should be ready because it ain't going to be easy. Or, uh, I guess I should have put, are you in the intensive care unit next? Are you in the intensive... Every once in a while, I get in that intensive care unit. If you see me in there, just come up and smack me upside the head and tell me to get into the pro progressive care unit. Usually, my wife is the first one to smack me upside the head, so it doesn't take too long. But. Or is your relationship with the church today, are you in training? Or do you have a satisfactory condition? Or... Are you out of shape? Are you out of shape? Your relationship with, the, with your church? Who's the head of the church? Christ. Okay. Are your relationship with the church in critical condition? Sometimes people, when they get mad at the church, they do what? They recuperate at home. Or is your relationship with the church in for test. And then there's another place for another comment. So a question that could arise when you look at something like that is, what is your, what is your greatest spiritual?
spiritual challenge. Because your challenges will tell you a lot about what you believe. What's your greatest spiritual challenge? What is it? In re- it, can, it, can be, it can be something in re- regards to God or something in regards to your church. What's your greatest spiritual challenge? I'm, I'm not going to go on for a little bit. Amen. Amen. Not getting distracted with the world is what Ashley is saying. Amen. That's a good one. Because the world desires to distract you. Satan's designed it that way. On the Lord. Tom, you remember that? Okay. most comprehensive studies I've seen that speak to uh, the percentage of evangelical Christians in America, real evangelical Christians, it's below 20% now. And they have, a, they have a, all this criteria that they use to determine if somebody is a real evangelical Christian. Of course, Things like church attendance, do you tithe, uh, all of these things. And when it, what it boils down, and that's why the country's in its, the condition it's in. Because America isn't Christian anymore. Really, it's not. It used to be. It was founded on those principles, but it's no longer, uh, those principles are no long, longer honored, so... Everything, everything else is honored, but not those principles. Anybody else a spirit? What's your greatest spiritual challenge? Fearful of. The what ifs? Yeah. The what ifs. Okay. Fear of the unknown. Yeah. That leads some people to anxiety. You know. Anybody else? Greatest spiritual challenge. Self-discipline, that's a good one. Oh, pardon me? Yeah, you could. Yeah. Oh. You mean... uh to give God his time? Okay. okay. Huh? Convenience? Ex- explain that. Long day, yeah. Yeah, I've had a long, 
I've made a long day too, but I'm already here, so I'm pretty lucky. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. I remember getting off work and over at the school district and saying, man, it'd be nice to go home. But I'd, I'd try to get there at 5.30 for quartet practice, and then at 6.30 was the service, and at 7.30 was the choir practice. On Wednesdays, that's how long it was. I guess, I'm trying to think of what my greatest spiritual challenge is. Probably my lack of belief that I'm uh, all that, that I'm, a, I'm able to do all God wants me to do. Probably. That'd be my greatest challenge. I oftentimes think I'm not, I'm not really up to the job at hand. But if God, if, if I believe God's chosen me, am I up to the job at hand? Yeah. Should be. Okay. And then uh, I ask you a couple more questions. How are you praying for your church and the church's relationship to Christ? How are you praying for your church and the church's relationship to Christ? And then the last one, how does God want you to help others in their walk with the Lord? Because that's really what we have to do. And there's, there's, here's some possible answers to that. To bear witness to what God has done in your life and what he is doing in your life. To help people understand God's ways and to experience his purposes. To encourage others to participate in the church's life. Lots of different ways. And then if you can, uh, Deanna, bring up Ephesians 3, please. Ephesians 3, 16. We'll go through 21. So as we close this study, this is my prayer for us. I pray that uh, I pray that God will grant you, according to the glory of His riches, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit. That's that's that strengthening would be in the inner man. Go ahead, Deanna. You would feel it within you. Verse 17. And that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. Then it says, I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and width, height and depth, depth, and to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge. To know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge. So you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. According to the power that works in you. He can do it. He can do everything. He's the power that's in you. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, we've, we've got a, we have a challenge before us. We're, we're going to try to have a lot more little people here. Okay? For Awana, and it's going to be so very, very important how we treat those little kids, how we express the love of God to them and their families is going to be extremely important. So if you wanted something to start your day with, you could always read Ephesians three, sixteen to twenty one. 
and uh, dwell on that, that God is the one that powers you. He's the one that dwells within you. Through him all things are powerful, are possible because he's all powerful and you can be a representative for him and uh, help change lives by what we're going to try to do at what we believe is God's direction with the Awana program. All right? Train up a child in the way they shall go, and they will never stray far from it. Anybody else? Tom Van Wart? That Tom. He's a rebel. He's a rebel. Well, you know, the world doesn't want you to raise your children. You know why? Because it wants to raise your children. You know? Amen. Anybody else? Well, thanks for participating in the study, and we'll start on a new subject next week. Let's all stand. I had another praise. Today I'd hit the 20.